John chapter number 6. We'll get right back into our study tonight. Those of you that are familiar and understand being here for a while with us, uh, we've been going through the book of John Sunday night. And we've made it up to John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6. Is there anything that I missed by way of announcement? Anything about what we're coming next week I need to announce anything you know about? Everything good? All right. I appreciate that. And, uh, and, 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 and can I just throw this plug in there? Uh, I know uh, Brother Adam told us when we come back from, let's see, we come back from Ohio, then we went back out to West Virginia. And uh, when we come back from the camp meeting in West Virginia, or the, the uh, youth camp in West Virginia, Brother Adam told me, he said, he said, now tell your wife, we've got everything covered. On the homecoming meal, all that's taken care of. She don't have to do anything. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> and you tell my wife not to do anything on that food. You're crazy. But anyway, I appreciate that. That's a blessing. I know my wife's going to do something anyway. I'm not about to tell her not to do that. She loves doing it. She loves cooking. And, uh, but you know what? It, it was a great, tremendous blessing to know that some people have got together and done some things and was thinking about my life. Amen. And thinking about that part of the ministry and being a blessing. And I appreciate that. And, and I know, I, I'm biased. I'm biased. She's my wife. And, and I know it's going to hurt y'all if she don't do anything. Say amen. amen. I know that. Y'all can say what you want to say. Well, I know how much she cooks when we have meals like that. Amen. Uh, but uh, I know she'll do a little something. She'll help out with that thing anyway. But just the thought, Brother Dale, of somebody thinking about, not just the pastor. Y'all think about me all the time. Y'all are a blessing to me. Y'all are encouraging to me. But to know that somebody's thinking about my wife and thinking about what she's going through with those babies, uh, those twins now, they're taking care of them and uh, being a blessing to them. And uh, they missed her. She went to Ohio and, and Brittany had a baby there yesterday. And uh, she went to Ohio and back. And they missed her. They let me know they missed her. Okay. Every, every, time, and, uh, every, every time I turn around, they'd be crying, ah! and they look at me like, you're not her. <laughs> and I, I tell them, boys, I'm the best you got right now. Just, just, just work with me. Just work with me. Amen. But uh, I appreciate my wife. She's a blessing. And all that she tackles and all that she does. And I, I praise the Lord for, for that. Amen. Continue to pray for her and uh, continue to be a blessing. And, and, and let me say this, and this is coming from my heart sincerely. If it ever gets down to a place, church, that you can't, you can't do anything for me, and you've got to choose. There's one, one opportunity to be a blessing to somebody comes into your life. Be a blessing to my wife. I, I'll be fine. If my wife is fine, I'll be fine. I learned a long time ago, happy wife, happy life. Amen. Amen. I can put up with a lot of nonsense and a lot of neglect if my wife's taken care of. And she's a blessing. And she's blessed by being a blessing. All right? Uh, so you remember that. You, you, be a, you be sweet to my wife. I appreciate that. That encourages my wife. You're showing me your love. You take care of her. And uh, y'all are blessed to her. So I appreciate that. All right. Y'all got your Bible turn. Yes. John chapter number 6. We've made it down to verse number 28. So let's jump in with both feet. Uh, if, if you're keeping up with it, it's 701. <coughs> 701. If you'd like to keep up with that. Story. Somebody asked me, they said, Preacher, why do you say that right before you get started preaching? Because I always want you to know when I'm just rambling and then when the preaching starts. Amen. Somebody said, you preach for two hours. No, I ramble for an hour. I preach for another hour. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So now we're starting. 701. John chapter 6. Notice with me. Let's begin to read in verse 28. We're going to read a few verses down here and look into a little bit more of our study. Now, if you'll remember, last week uh, we had concluded with the fall of what was happening there in Capernaum. Uh, remember all that took place, all that happened, what the Lord had done. And uh, the, the, the multitude was fed, the five loaves, two fish, all of that had taken place the week before. <laughs> And then uh, he sent the disciples, they got on the boat, they left, and he went up on the mountain. And, uh, well, said they sent them, but in this text of Scripture, it doesn't say he sent them. If you remember, we talked about that last week, they left. He was still up on the mountain. And uh, they left and went out across the sea. And then in the middle of the night, the Lord came down and began to walk across the sea over there. And when he got in the boat with them, they were immediately at the other side. They were there in Capernaum. And then the people, the multitude that had eaten of the fish and the bread, experienced that great miracle. They came down one more. Now, Jesus told them what they really wanted, didn't he? They come down. They're, they're talking about, we're, we're, we're wanting to find the master. No, Jesus said, you just want your belly to do it again. And, and, and in layman terms. He just said, you come looking for the feeling. You come looking for the food. You come looking for the miracle that you saw. He said, but that's not what you need. <laughs> he said, you need to bring alive what you need. 
So that's where we're kind of taking up to the quiz right here. That multitude of people has now sailed across the sea and they're over there and they look at Jesus and how in the world did you get over here? There was no other ship. The only one ship was one we saw leave and you was on it and now you're here. How'd this happen? Jesus said, let's don't worry about how I got here. Let's think about this. What do you need? And he throws that back in their place. If you come looking for a physical feeling, well, I'm telling you, he said, you need something different. You need something more. So that's kind of what we're taking up with here in verse 28. The Bible says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. Now notice, I love my King James Bible. How many of y'all love your King James Bible? Amen. Well, I love my King James Bible. Notice the letters of your Bible. A lot of times we focus on the words, but notice the letters. They said, they said how can we work the works of God? He said, this is the work of God. You see that singular right there? And I don't want to get ahead of myself and outrun this as we study it. But I'm going to tell you, there's so many times, if we're not careful, we put so much on our plate, we forget the most important thing God wants out of our life. They said, how can we work the works? Jesus said, this is the work. One thing. One thing. <coughs> Sometimes that one thing might have many avenues, but there's one particular work that's more important to God than anything else. Amen. Let's keep reading. He said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. They said, therefore, now, now, now pay attention to that, because we'll look at three things in particular, three, three particular things. The first would be in the work of God. He said, rather, the work of God is that you believe on him who he hath sent. Y'all know what the word work means, right? It means doing something. Work. It means having to, having to really press through. I tell my guys all the time, they, they complain about, oh, boss, I want to I wanna leave early today. I don't want to be here today. And I tell them, I said, listen, I said, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And they said, we don't love what we do. I said, I don't either, but I'm just telling you. If you ever love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Amen. I go to work every day. Why? Because I don't love what I do. But I, I do that now. Now, standing in this pulpit, this ain't work. I love this. I love being a pastor. I love preaching the gospel. I, I love sharing the gospel with people. I love digging into the word and seeing what God has to say to a group of people when they'll sit and listen. That's not work for me. Amen. He said the work of God is believing on him to sin. Remember that, all right? Verse 30. They said, therefore, to him. Now, notice the change of attitude. What sign showest thou then? That we may see and believe thee. And then they throw this in. Why did they say that? What does thou work? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? You know what they said? So, well, preacher, you're on us to go do something now. Give us a sign that we need to do this. And by the way, what are you going to do? That's exactly what they just said. Did y'all see that in that scripture? How airy. He just fed them with nothing they had in their hand. One little boy had a bag of lunch. And he took that one little boy's bag of lunch and he fed over 5,000 men that was there. And now they're grumbling, complaining, what kind of work are you going to do? He just fed you, man. Sit down and be busy. Ain't that something? Ain't it amazing how we get, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but ain't it amazing how we get an attitude when God says we've got to do something? He said, this is the work of God. And they said, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, what are you going to do? Notice what Jesus said. Notice what, why? Well, they said a little bit more than Jesus answered. Notice this. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And can I remind us again, this is a crowd that just ate something from nothing. <laughs> and they're saying, well, back in Moses' day, they just went outside and picked it up off the ground and ate it. Isn't that sad? They said, if you remember, Jesus said, sit them down and hear me and y'all wait on them. They were sitting there like in a fine restaurant, waiting on the disciples to bring their food to them that Jesus was blessing, and all they had to do was eat it. And now they're saying, what kind of sign are you going to give us? Because, you know, our forefather, they had manna from heaven, that bread from heaven fell down. Ain't, ain't this terrible what people, people just want something all the time. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's what they're doing. Now notice this. Jesus said in verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. 
<laughs> he said, that wasn't bread from heaven. That's just some man. He said, that wasn't bread from heaven. Because he says this. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Amen. Now here's another thing we look at. For the bread of God. See, we have the work of God. Now we've got the bread of God. He said, the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. <laughs> They're still looking for a loaf of something. They're still looking for something to go into their physical body. Is that not what we studied last week? Jesus said, you're wanting to fill your belly. You need to think more spiritual. That's what he told them last week when we studied it. And they're still saying, give us that bread. We want to eat. We want bread. We want you to do another miracle. That's exactly what they're saying. But I noticed this. It's, it's, it's so amazing. Why, why would you want to read some kind of drama fiction magazine? Just read the Bible. It's so exciting. If you just read the Bible, God makes things so exciting. We just can't help but enjoy reading it. Amen. Notice this. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Can you see him getting frustrated with people right here? <laughs> He's telling them. He said, the word of God is that you believe on the one that he sent. And he's looking like, are you connecting with me? Yeah. And they said, well, you know, Moses gave us bread and then, and then, and then a man fell from heaven. And he's like, that's not, he that's not heavenly bread. The Father, and it's like Jesus, all right, let me go this way. Let me explain it this way so you'll hear and understand what I'm saying. The Father is going to send you heavenly bread in the one that he sent. And they're still like, oh, okay, give us that bread. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Preachers, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like I am trying to make this so easy for everybody to understand and nobody is getting this? Let me just be real blunt right here. If you don't get saved, you're going to hell. That's kind of the mood that Jesus is bringing to these people right now. I am the bread of life. <coughs> but notice how he says this. It shows you the compassion of our loving Savior. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, now this is Jesus telling them, Jesus knows your mind, he knows your heart. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. He said, you're sitting there looking at me. And you still don't believe that I am the Son of God. That I am the bread of life. You still don't believe. Isn't that amazing? But now notice this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me. See, there's no more talking about the bread. He's now saying, this is the will of the Father who sent me. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? <laughs> Notice this. He said, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. I don't know if y'all seen this week. I've got one more verse I'm going to read. We're going to go back and look at the study right quick. I don't know if y'all read between the lines of seeing this like I am. But it's almost like Jesus is saying, I didn't come to do what I want to do. Because right now, y'all got me pretty aggravated. And if I did what I want to do right now, I'd probably hurt some of y'all. Now, preachers, we've got to be real careful. Because sometimes we won't do what we want to do. Jesus himself, in human flesh, said, I didn't come to do what I want to do. I came to do what the Father wants me to do. And he just got through saying, I am the bread of life. And he just got through saying, you see me, but you still don't believe. So he's, he's got that frustrated flesh. I'm going to tell you something. His flesh was the same flesh you and I live in. Right. Jesus was tempted of all temptations just like you and I are tempted. The Bible makes that very clear to us. So don't think for a second that as a preacher, as the man of God, as the person telling the people about the Father's will, he's not going to get aggravated because they won't hear what he's saying. They're going to understand what he's saying. He's getting very aggravated right here. And he's telling them, I'm not here doing what I want to do, but I'm doing what he wants me to do. So if you come, <laughs> I'm not going to cast you out. 
Because he said to everybody that he gave to me their time. Isn't that amazing? Now, that, this is Jesus just being very blunt with him. Very upfront. But now notice verse 40. And this is the will of him. We've seen the work of God. We've seen the bread of God. Now we're seeing the will of God. Jesus comes right back out of that mode, Brother Dale, of wanting to go ahead and just cast them all out. <laughs> but he said, I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm here to do what my father wants me to do. In human flesh, he overcomes that temptation. He conquered that temptation, the same things he should have said. He conquered that temptation of doing things he shouldn't do. How many times are we able to do that? Amazing. Same place you're not walking. He walked in it. He conquered it. He wanted to do what he told him. I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm doing what he wants me to do. Right. Right. He conquered it. He overcome it. He, he passed by the temptation. He proved to be the better man. Amen. Even though he was 100% God, he was 100% man. Right. And he proved himself the better man. And you know what he gave us promise? Greater than these things shall you do. Amen. Amen. We have no excuse for failing Losing our temper, saying things, doing things we should never have done, and hurting someone we should never hurt. We have no excuse. You know, Michael, Jesus, and I can do it. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Amen. Amen. So we've got, we've got him to help us. And notice how he comes right back out of that, right into verse 40. He said, and this is the will of him that's in me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up. I'm going to tell you something, y'all. If we will overcome the temptation of losing every bit of sanity we've got when people just won't go the way we want to go, when people won't do what we want to do, if we'll overcome the temptation of just losing our testimony with them and do what God wants us to do, we can be just as mellow and calm as Jesus was and tell people just how much it benefits them to come and follow God. Right. It's hard. It's very hard. That's why we have this Bible. To help us, to right. teach us, to guide us. This, this is not this is not a sledgehammer to beat people on the head with. God didn't give us this book to beat people to death. Right. Right. He said it's sharper than two edged sword. He wants you to know when you grab it, be careful. Listen, little Levi, stand back here. Stand, stand up in your seat, Levi. Levi, stand up on your seat a minute. Stand up where everybody can see you. There's little Levi. They ain't a doubt in my mind if I give that boy a sledgehammer, he'll find something to tear up. He's got it in him. It, it's right there. But you know what? When that boy grabs the sledgehammer, it don't scare me one bit for him to grab that handle and drag it across the ground. Because I know until he gets that thing up there, he ain't going to hurt nothing. But you know what would scare me? It's for him to grab a hold of a sword. Even if he can't pick it up off the ground. He's come down there and I've got some swords in my study. And, and them boys, they love them swords. And he always wants to look at them swords. He always wants to grab them swords. And I tell you, be careful. That thing, you'll, you'll hurt yourself. I've got a hammer over there on my bookshelf. He grabbed that hammer and looked at it. All I do is tell him, be careful, don't tear nothing up. But that sword, when he grabs it, he can hurt himself. Right. I said, come here, let me, let me help you. And I'll get one of them down off the wall or get one down off the bookshelf, and I'll let him hold that sword. I said, what do you think about that? And he, his eyes get real big, he'll hold that sword. I, oh, yeah, he cut something up with that. He could do some damage with that. But see, God's letting us know his Bible's just like that two edged sword. And it's even sharper than that. Why? Because he wants us to be cautious right. as we yeah. grab that book out and throw it out. Thank you, Levi. You can sit down. You did a good job, buddy. Now, think about this God has given us his word, he's given us the tool that we need to do everything that needs to be done in the gospel study. But he said, without the ability, to handle yourself properly, all you're going to do is hurt yourself and hurt other people. So he warns us how valuable his word is, but how dangerous it is if we don't know what we're doing. Right. Amen. So let's let's see what Jesus is telling us. Now I've already read a lot, and we talked about it, we've already read a lot just out of that too. Just how the way he's speaking, the way he's talking, and what he's doing. We've read a lot already, we've already seen a lesson. On how we need to be careful about conducting ourselves when we're under the temptation of losing our cool. When we're under the temptation of losing our testimony. When we call it losing our temper, it's not losing your temper, it's grabbing your temper. And your temper taking hold of you. It's not losing your temper. We need to all lose our temper. It's losing control of your temper. That's the problem that we have. Because we've all got a temper. And we all get angry. And Jesus said, be angry. 
mad. You ever, you, ever, you ever felt like the Lord just said, go ahead and be mad? Get angry. The Lord said, be angry. That's a command. He said, be angry. If you don't get angry sometimes, there's something wrong. Because Jesus said, be angry. There ought to be some things that make you angry. But now notice what else he said. He said, be angry and sin not. Amen. He said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Right. There ain't nothing wrong with being angry. God wants us to be angry. It's healthy to be angry sometimes. It's very healthy for you. Why? Because it stirs your entire nervous system. It stirs your entire circulatory system. Your blood pumps. Your heart pumps. It's like exercise for the inside man when you get angry. But he says, now when you're angry, don't you see it? And he said, if wrath comes through that anger... Don't let the sun go down on that wrath. Are you hearing that? He said, be angry. Nothing wrong with being angry. He said, but don't sin when you get angry. And he said, if you do, and you carry it too far, and wrath comes in that anger, he said, before the sun goes down, you fix that. Amen. And what he's saying there, honestly, when he's saying, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, he's literally saying, if you can control that anger, Control it and don't be wrathful and keep control until the sun goes down. That way you don't have to get no forgiveness. <laughs> Amen. Now, how many of us do that very well? <laughs> Says the preacher that preached with two casts on his hands not long ago. <laughs> Thank God I didn't hit anybody. Amen. But I sure made a fool of myself, didn't I? Amen. That ain't been very long ago, it's a few years back. What do you say? That's not an easy thing. It's not easy at all. So we've learned a great lesson just out of how he conducted himself. Right. And what I hope we can put that in our pocket and take it home yes. and learn from that right there. But let's look at the words that he said now. Let's look at the words that he said right quickly. Uh, and praise God, we've only been preaching 20 minutes. We're out of now. Amen. We've got another hour yet. Amen. Can I say this? In the very first verse we read, verse 28, the people said this. They said, uh, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? I, I, I made a little insignia right here on this verse. I simply said this. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't ever feel like you shouldn't ask God something. God wants us to ask questions. God wants us to understand things. I was. Uh, I, I, I hope. I hope she's listening to me down in the nursery camera down there. Well, I guess the camera's up here. The the TV down there. I hope she's listening because Miss Ever, we were talking back here. Little Jeremiah was asking me a lot of questions when I came in, and he he just kept bombarded with questions. Just kept bombarded with questions. Just kept asking questions. And Miss Amber said, "All right, Nosy." She said, "That's what Chad calls him. His new nickname is Nosy." I looked at him. I said, "Hey, we don't ever ask questions. We never find out anything, do we?" Amen. And I, I don't mind those questions. If, if it ever gets carried away into me questions, I'll just walk away. <laughs> and be like, man, that was rude. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind little kids asking. I would love. I would love for these children to ask me fifty questions apiece, in comparison to them never speak to me. Amen. Never speak to me. Amen. I got one of the little bus girls. I can't remember her name. She sits back here, the little short one, the little tiny one. What's her name? She's in Miss Amber's class, I believe. Miss Amber, Miss Destiny. Amaya. Amaya, is that it? The little girl sits back there with her bigger sister. Amaya. Amaya. I got little Amaya to, to smile at me for the first time today. I am so tickled. <laughs> and, and I found it out through somebody else's action. Amen. She was back there, and uh, and and uh, Brother Greg didn't realize what he did. He opened up a whole new world for me. We're standing back there, and I do everything I can every Sunday. There's some male figure in her life that looks like me that she cannot stand. <laughs> Gotta be, amen. It might be a female figure with a long facial hair. I don't know. But there's somebody that she can't stand that I remind her of. And every time I try to talk to her, I say, hey, sweetheart, how you doing? Hey, honey, how you doing? I thought, well, maybe these words are making her feel uncomfortable. I mean, she's just, what, four? How old is she? Somewhere around four years old? And, and maybe these words are making her feel maybe I'm, I'm too pushy on her. Maybe, maybe I need to back off a bit. So I'm, I'm like, hey, young lady, how are you doing? Still won't shake my hand. She won't look at me, won't talk to me, have nothing to do. I said, I, I'll get you now. And, and she's just like, get away from me. You're above. Well, this, 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 this afternoon, we were eating, finishing the service, going out there. And Brother Greg came up and just grabbed the whole ear and twisted her little ear like that. And she just grinned real big. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I wish she was 
easier to defend himself because the first thing I thought, he ain't as handsome as I am. He's not as suave as I am. He's not as wonderful as I am. And don't say amen to that, sister. Please don't say amen. I'm just kidding. Love, Brother Greg. So I'm sitting there thinking, now how in the world? I've been trying this for a year to get this girl smiling at me. He goes up and twists her ear a little bit, and she just grins like a possum. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. So I tried. I thought, all right. I, tried. I look at her and said, I know now what makes you smile. She just gives me that look. And I reached up and I grabbed the same exact ear that Greg grabbed. And I rubbed it just like he did. And she grinned real big. I said, nah. <laughs> Now, every time I see I'm going to rub that ear a little bit. And I hope that rubbing that ear will turn into saying hello one morning. Hey, preacher, how are you? And I don't know what's going to happen. Might get a lawsuit. I might, I might end up pinching a blood blister on her, on her ear or something. I don't know. You never know. But there's a great door open right there. She actually, she actually smiled at me. You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for communication. I'm looking for her to trust me so much that she one day would say, Preacher, why does this do this? How, how do we do this? What's the reason for this? And, and I'm looking for those questions because I'd rather these kids ask me question after question after question after question as to ignore me because they don't want to talk to me. Don't you ever feel like God don't want to hear your question? Because he does. Amen. Now at this point, at this point of the conversation, you've got to remember, they went all the way across the sea. And they're literally looking for Jesus. So this ain't just, they just bumped into him, you know, the, they're part of the Jews, the, 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 the Pharisee crowd that's wanting to crucify him. No, they just come over because he blessed them, he encouraged them, he, he, he fed them with a great miracle. They're looking for him now. They go all the way across the sea and get over there and say, wow, how did you get here? They're con sincerely concerned about this, and they say simply this, how can we work the works of God? There's nothing wrong with a question like that at all. God is very happy to answer a question like that to me. It pleases him. He literally said in his Bible, if there's any man that lacks wisdom, ask of me. And he said, I'll give it to him liberally. Right. And no greater than not. He said, I want you to be smart. Yes, sir. I want you to know all about me. Ask me anything you want. Amen. Yeah. Don't ever be afraid to talk to Christ. Yeah. Don't ever be afraid to talk to God. God wants to hear from you. That's right. He wants to hear your questions. He wants to hear your concerns. He knows everything that's going on with you. Yes, sir. He just wants to hear you communicate with him. Amen. Amen. That's good. Now listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I told this to my wife today, and I won't be cautious how I say this, but when I got to that one part of the service this, this morning, was right there near the end, I started talking about those physical relationships that, that we're uncomfortable with, things that were just wrong, things that hurt us, things that, that abused us and upset us. There was a lot of little eyes looking at me, and you can see they were hearing exactly what I said. There was a lot of little eyes connected with me, and some big eyes too. And they, they were connected with me. They know. Some of you sitting right here, you know what it feels like to go through those things. I said, I, I, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a preacher that you can't talk to. Amen. I, I don't want to be a preacher that you feel like ah, I can't talk to. You don't know anything about anything. I want to, I want to be one of those pastors that you are very comfortable. Even if I don't know what you're going through or I can't tell you, we can't talk back because I have no idea. I want to be one of those pastors that you're comfortable talking to and asking questions. And, and feeling, feeling confident that you're going to get a good answer. Amen? It's not just my opinion, or I'm not trying to trying to drive you down a certain road. You, you know the, the old terminology, mule driving? I used to have some horses that had a mule drive. That's something that would neck rain real good. You just lay the rain over, they just go wherever you want to, drive like a Cadillac. Had some you had to pull them around hard, kick them hard, and make them mule drive. I don't want, I don't want to think, you to think I'm mule driving you anywhere. I want you to feel comfortable asking the questions and then give you honest answers to help you in your problem. Whatever it is. If you're in the problem, if there used to be a problem, if the problem is coming, and, and we can help we can help through the word of God get to where we need to be so you can go through that problem and get over it and go on in life in victory, that's what it's all about. Amen. God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear those questions. And when there's sincere questions like that, you know what he's going to do? He's going to give you a sincere answer. What did Jesus do? They said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. He tells them, he said, it's only one thing that God wants you to do. You're, you're thinking all these works? No, 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 no. There's one thing God wants you to do. And he says this, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Amen. Now, that is when their attitude changed. That is when they got a little more arrogant in their questioning. God, God don't want you questioning his authority. 
God don't want you questioning him in mockery because you disagree with him. But God wants you to hear every question you've got. Jesus himself said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was very sincere in a question. He wanted to ask that question. Why? Because he wanted us to know that we can ask God questions. He's very approachable. But I'm going to tell you something. When God gives you the answer and you don't like the answer, <coughs> that means you know right to be arrogant. Right. Do you see their attitude change? How is our attitude after God answers our question? That's good. <laughs> they said, what can we do to work the works of God? He said, there's only one work of God. He said, that's that you believe on the one that he has sent. That's all, that's all God wants you to do. And then, that's when they got arrogant. What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? Now all of a sudden, this one that they had full confidence in, now they're saying, I'm not so sure I even believe you. Why? Because you just told me I had to work. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you something. It's a work to believe that Jesus has paid it all. It's a work. Amen? Now I understand salvation is a free gift. I understand it completely. But it is a work to accept that free gift. That's a hard thing to do. They, some of y'all, if I was to walk up to you right now and offer you a $20 bill, I would have to break your arm, twist your wrist, and put it in the side of your britches pocket. You wouldn't take it. It's a free gift. I don't want that. I don't need that. I, I, I've had people get offended and want to fight because I've offered them a piece of money. It's a work to accept the gift sometimes. We went, I told y'all this story, it's been quite a while back now, we were to work. And we went out for a lunch break or, or a breakfast break, something like that. And we got in line. And as we were getting in line, the lines were changed a little bit, so we, we got over in this line right here. And when we got over this line, it, we kind of cut this older gentleman off. Not, not really, I mean, that's when the line was moving. But, but when we got there in line, you know, I, I just saw the look on his face. He didn't do anything wrong. Or, or, I see the look on his face like, this is not what I want. I, I didn't want them to cut in front of me in line. I wanted my biscuit before they got there. I can just see that look on his face. My son was driving, so I got out of the car and I run back to the gentleman. And you can see when I was walking back there, he had to look on his face like, "All right, this young couple just come back here and run his mouth. I'm fixing to give him one for." And he had that look because I'm running back there. And I've got the work clothes on. I'm not coming back there like a preacher. God bless your brother. <laughs> no, I, I'm coming back there. I'm running back in the work clothes. He's already kind of agitated because we got in front of him in line, and, and, and he rolled down and said, "What?" <laughs> I said, sir, I said, I said, I realize the lines just cut you off. I, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I said, here, let me buy you breakfast. No, you ain't going to buy my breakfast. Yeah, I, really, seriously, I want to do this. Lord, put this on my heart. I want to be a blessing to you. I don't want to be a problem for you today. And he gets mad. He gets angry. And, and he yelled at me. Just get back in your car. And me being the nice guy that I am, <laughs> I rolled up that money and I threw it in the window. <laughs> and I said, I am buying your breakfast. <laughs> And I started walking back. And Brother Troy, he's shaking his fist out his window at me. And everybody's looking at us like we're going to get in a fight or something. And I'm buying the man's breakfast. He said, I don't want you to buy my breakfast. I said, but I want to. And you're going to have to accept it. And I went and got in the car. I shut the door. I locked the door in case he came up there. And I looked back. I pulled my visor mirror down. I looked back at him. And he was back there crying. And he's gathering up that money out of seat. And he had a big smile on his face. He, he had to work for that blessing. He had to work for that gift. He wasn't going to take it. He didn't want it. I'll tell you, that's the way most people are in life. Right. And receiving the blessings of God is a work. It's a challenge. Amen. You've got to be willing to humble yourself down. Amen. You've got to be willing to, to make your pride stay at bay. Right. You've got to be willing to come up. And, let, let me just throw this out here. And please do this. And, and, there, and there are some wonderfully uh, saint, saints of God that have been saints of God for a long time, Sister Martha. You can't get her to take a dollar bill. <laughs> now, y'all going to let me preach to Miss Martha for just a minute. Y'all listen. Take the advice. Sister Martha, one of these new babies in Christ. Now, Miss Abby, she's been saying, well, three weeks now. Three weeks. If she ever comes off you a piece of money, you take that and say, sweetheart, thank you so much. No, that's hard work, ain't it? I see it. You wouldn't even look me in the eye. Because you know why? She's going to do something to be blessed. And she, she's not trying to buy your love. You give it to her. Y'all, since she got saved, y'all sit closer than anybody I've ever seen in my life. 
She's fell in love with you. And she wants to bless you, bless you let her bless you. Because what's happening, God's building her. And let her see it's better to be a blessing That's right. than to receive a blessing. Yeah. And sometimes in order to teach a babe in Christ that, we've got to fight pride. Right. We've got to fight humility. And we, we've got to put all that back. That's work. And we've got to say, sure, thank you. That's a blessing. You are such a blessing. And, 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 and I know what Miss Morgan would do. It's okay. It's okay. Do this. Instead of refusing that blessing, do this. Take that money and put it back. Go over there and give that to Brother Troy. <laughs> Say, Brother Troy, I have gave him this money. Would you take that and make sure she gets it back somehow? Now, it'll be up to Brother Troy if he does that wrong. <laughs> he, he said, depending on the amount of money. I don't know. He said, well, what happens is you, you, you build up the character of that baby in Christ. And they're getting stronger. They're growing. They're maturing. They, they feel good. Because why? The Bible does say it's better to give than to receive. So therefore they're learning. They stepped over that threshold, that hurdle in their life. Now it's in full praise God. It is a blessing to give somebody. And they took it and it was wonderful. Because you know what happens? If we say, no, honey, I ain't taking that. You keep that. But, but God told me, I don't care what God told you. God told me not to take it. What you've just done is you crushed that little child of God. That's right. And they think, well, I know God told me to do that, but now they're saying God didn't tell me to do that. Now I'm confused. They put that money back in their pocket and they walk off thinking, well, Lord, I thought you would tell me. Maybe that wasn't you. And the next time, when God says, give this person $20, they're like, no, 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 wait, no, I've been through that with Miss Parker. Well, she made me feel like I didn't know what I was talking about. I'm still preaching, Martha. Y'all hang on. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I was not in the will of God, so maybe I should hold on to this $20 right now and make sure that that is what I need to do. That's good, church. And then it is a blessing. So see, we've got, we got to realize working is a hard thing to do. And the Lord said you've got to work to receive him that he sent. You've got to work to receive Jesus. You gotta put some things out of life. You gotta put some things out of play. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? Man, the work. We y'all y'all speed read too much. You, you try to read your Bible through a year and you just fly through verses like and you ain't got a clue what you're reading. You slow down. Slow down and read your Bible. If you don't do some speed reading, that's fine. But I'm gonna tell you when it comes to study, you better read your Bible. Amen. Well, that's where you get some help. Amen. The Lord, the Lord is letting them get some help right here. <laughs> We've got to watch our attitude after we get the answer from God. Because I'm going to tell you, most of the time, God's going to require some work out of us. But it's not always that hard to lay and knock an old thousand doors today. Man, I'm going to be tired. I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast for three days the whole time. That's not what I'm always talking about. He's talking about working your flesh out of the way. Getting yourself. What was it they were wanting? They were wanting their belly filled. Remember? Jesus said, you've got to quit that. You've got to quit thinking about that. And quit thinking about your well-being. Think about what God wants out of you. And then all your well-being will be taken care of. Amen. I'll tell you, you keep putting back for retirement, keep putting back for retirement, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. i got a 401k where I work at, and then one day I'm, I'm praying to use that if the Lord comes back in, in, in another business where I can use that. That's not a bad thing to put back for retirement. It's a bad thing to hoard back all for yourself and you know other needs. You know other things. You know other responsibilities that need to be met. And you're hoarding all back. You gotta be careful. Y'all heard them stories. We read them stories. People die of a pulper. They're out on the street. They're pushing a shopping cart all the day of their life and they're, they're living like a bum and they got a million dollars in the bank. And we say, well, that, that was a good person. No, that was really a nut. The people could have been helped. I'm going to tell you the good person. If they'll push that shopping cart, they live like that. That's perfectly okay. That's wonderful. If they want to live like that, that's great. But why hoard back a million dollars when you're on the street and you see all the problems on the street? I would love for my testimony if that's what the Lord put in my heart, but she did. Thank God. Could you imagine having to push a shopping cart with 12 kids? <laughs> but I would like to be the testimony for Joshua. Yeah, he lived like a bum. He never, he never drove anything over a thousand dollar car. 
would be a five million dollars away in his life. He put that family back in a home when they were on the street. He bought, he bought a bus for that church when they needed somebody to give them to church. He, he gave a house to this person over here because they needed the house. That was the testimony I'd love to have. Oh, he had a million dollars. If it's lower now, you can't have it because he doesn't spend it on everybody else but himself. Good. Now, that would be a testimony. That would be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Well, I know, I know what happened if I died and left five million dollars. I'd have, I'd have eleven young ones fighting each other near death. <laughs> but boys, I'm telling you right now, I ain't leaving you nothing. <laughs> I want y'all to love each other. <laughs> That's it. I'm divorcing my dad. I'm going to go work. They go knocking on Brother Troy's door. <laughs> Brother Troy, that ain't gonna leave me nothing. You got any money? <laughs> well, I got good kids. I hope to leave them all something. A testimony. What is our attitude after we get our answer from God? Let's wrap this up. Many people, many people, when they hear what God wants them to do, and it requires some work on their part, some work on, on who they're going to become and who they're going to be to receive what God wants from them. You know what they do, right? They assault the plan of God. They, they assault God. They assault His plan. Jesus come right out. He told them in verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. You know what that word evermore means, right? Get on it right now and don't stop. <laughs> evermore, right now. Don't say another word. Just give me the bread. That's kind of the spirit that was in that prodigal when he came to his father. Yes, sir. I'm not, I'm not willing to wait on what you're wanting to accomplish in my life. I'm not willing to wait on the character that you're trying to establish in who I'm being. I'm not willing to wait on the attributes that you want me to glisten in this life and others appreciate me in life. I just want what I want right now. They said, evermore, just right now, just give me the bread. Quit talking, quit going on, just give me the bread. We get that spirit somewhere. Usually it's after the preacher's been preaching for about 45 minutes. <laughs> just give the invitation, preacher. Just, just give the invitation. Y'all know there's open invitation from day one. Right when we open the door, there's an invitation. Amen. You need to use it. That's right. But don't, don't, don't muzzle the ox that's treading the corn. Right. Let him preach. Let him speak. Let him move forward. Put your children's ears right up to the word. Amen. I don't know about you, but, but if I saw the urgency of the day we're living in, how soon it is to be over, if I saw the urgency of teenagers being in the house of God and under the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ instead of on the streets being tempted by the things of this world, I would want them to stay here hours on end. And I would be disappointed when the preacher let me out in a two-hour service. Because I'm here thinking, my son didn't get saved yet. Preacher, why are you stopping? I've turned to my wife before. You can ask her this. We've been in churches before, and they give those, you know, they give those 30-second invitations. And, and, and actually, I've been in an altar before, praying and agonizing. God broke my heart. The message is a wonderful message. Broke my heart. God's God burned my heart for my children. And I've been in an altar before, begging God to save my kids. And the priest says, Well, okay, that's it. We're gonna wrap it up. And I'm like, I'm just now starting to pray, friend. I looked over my wife before and everything she does like that. I'm like, what was the point of all that good message? If it ain't gonna give folks time to deal with it. Uh, okay, we're done now. I've done all I can do, and I'm leaving. That stuff drives me crazy. Yes, sir. I'm even let God do his business. Now you can tell somebody just running on and on and on and on and on, on and it's just a, it's just a merry go around their living, and I understand that. But we gotta be compassionate to what God's doing. Time, Sometimes God will give you a 15 minutes message. And praise God for it if you get to go home and eat early and God done what he didn't want to do. Good. But sometimes God might give you an hour and 15 minute message. Are we still want it that good? Or now we're thinking, man, preacher, can't you get the points out quicker than that? Really? Do you really have to chase that many rabbits? Amen. <laughs> Sometimes we, we assault God. We assault his plan. Jesus said he's given the bread of heaven. He's given the bread of life. He sent it down from heaven for you. And 
They're not willing to wait on the bread that they need. They're not willing to wait till he goes to Calvary. They're not willing to wait till he sets up his eternal kingdom. They're not willing to wait till the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God completely unite and join together. They're not willing to wait on that. They just said, give me a bread. I want the bread now. That's what I want in my life. Patience is virtue. Let patience have her perfect work. We know tribulations escort patience. We understand that. But are we willing to go through the tribulation to accept the patience that we can receive the blessings that God really wants in our life? Sure. Well, my voice was coming to me right now. I said, give me everything that's coming to me. I will. I give them that five dollar bill and I swipe with my bill as they walk out the door. That's all that's coming to them. And they walk away and live in the world and act like the world and pretend to be the world and, and lose everything they've got. Blow that whole $5 in one minute. <laughs> now they would be foolish to come back and say, oh dad, I need some more. No, I'm sorry son. I'm here providing for those that are stuck with the stuff. Now, how many times do we expect the preacher, the church, everybody around, and God to turn over on the dime and give everything they've got to somebody that's going to turn around in five days and walk out again. Well, good. And pacify somebody that's just going to keep on doing what uh, they're doing yeah. instead of feeding the sheep. If I'm not mistaken, Jesus told Peter, do you love me? And he said, you know I love you. He said, well, feed my sheep. He didn't say keep trying to get them goats in and waste all the sheep food. There's going to be some goats that just ain't going to come. He said, feed the sheep. Feed the sheep. Peter, if you really love me, that has him three times. Not because the Lord didn't hear him, but because Peter didn't hear his own heart. And finally, he was grieved. The Bible said he was grieved. He said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Peter, feed the sheep. <laughs> he finally got it through his heart. That third time. There's a lot of trees in Peter's life, wasn't there? Cock crowed three times. And then he heard the message of the preacher. <laughs> a lot of trees in Peter's life. You know what that three is? It's the truth. God's trying to show Peter, I'm in your life. I'm very present. And I'm a very present help in your time of trouble. And he does the same thing to you and I. Again and again and again. It's in the midst of that struggle. That's when we see his presence. If we're willing to hear what he's saying. Don't assault God in his plan. Accept the plan of God. Even if it's a longevity time. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want to wait on, the Cal on Calvary and the resurrection. They wouldn't want to wait on that eternal kingdom. They were wanting bread right now. Be careful of that spirit. Amen? Last but not least, let's wrap this thing up. Accepting the will of God. Accepting. Don't, don't assault God's plan. Don't, don't assault God. Don't, don't, to, don't make him feel or try to make him feel. You can't make him feel, but don't try to make him feel he's insufficient. Because he's perfectly everything we need. Amen. I promise you that. But the greatest thing you'll do is accept the will of God. This is what amazes me. Jesus telling them it would seem like the same exact thing that he said up there when he said the work of God is. But now it's not. He's saying the will of him is <laughs> that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. He said your work is going to be able to accept Jesus Christ. That's your work. Accepting him. He said but the will of God is no work whatsoever on our part. <laughs> he said that is you Believing on him and letting him change your life. See, a lot of people get this little area confused because of putting works with the will and all these different things. He said, Oh no, the work of God, that work part is on you. You've got to work to really believe on him. You've got to work. He said, But once you do, he said, The will of God is simply this. Everyone which sees the Son believes on him and has everlasting life. Jesus said, I'll raise them up. In the last day. So what we realize is this, Brother Dale. God says the work part is on us getting ourselves out of the way. 
and getting our opinion out of the way, getting our desire out of the way, and then letting God's will work in our life completely. But you know what happens? When the will of God works in our life and expresses himself through the salvation in our life, others will see not our works, but our will. The will of God. Amen. Now our works brings forth the light that's in us that this world can see. How good of God we've got. But the will doesn't just let people see how good of God we've got, but it lets people experience how good of God we've got. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That means they're glorifying God over what they're seeing in your life. But the will of God is that they experience everlasting life. Amen. So when you let the will of God express itself through your life instead of just your works, people don't just see what's going on in you. I've got lost people that come up to me and say, Man, God's blessed you. You better believe God's blessed me. He sure has. Why? Because they see the works. But after we sit down and have a conversation, Brother Dale, tears run down my face. And I say, you know what? God has blessed me. Because it wasn't just seeing the good guy that you are, but it's now experiencing the good God that's in the good guy. Amen. Amen. That changes their life. Yes, yes sir. sir. Amen. You can be good to people. You can express good works all the time, and people will like you. But our good works and people liking us mean nothing to their eternity. They need to see the will of God in you working that they can understand what God wants them to do. Amen. And when God does his will, I didn't read where there was any works on our part. <laughs> because God's will is just to express himself through you. That's why when you get saved, there's an artesian well inside of you springing up the everlasting life. Does that mean the well keeps springing up so we can keep everlasting life? No. That means the well springs up in our life and out of our life. That others can taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. That's the will of God. Amen. What a blessing. Man, John was connected with yes, yes, sir. I believe if there's ever been a man I want to study after it's John. Peter's a great demanding man. He's a great leader and great authority figure. But I'm going to tell you, John leaned upon the breast of Jesus. That's right. And when he laid upon that breast... He become very close to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, John is probably one of the greatest men that we've ever followed in the Word of God. And know what it means to follow other people. Amen. Let's stand our feet. Say if you would come to the piano. God, may he spoke to your heart today. Maybe, maybe your relationship with Christ is not as, as, as intimate and exciting as you want to be. There's a change for this. It's emptying out yourself and giving yourself more to Him. Could, could I just throw this in for good measure? Hopefully, this isn't uh, this isn't uh, criticism against someone in this area. But if you're married and you have a beautiful bride, or vice versa, if you have a beautiful husband, handsome, wonderful husband, however you want to say it, and he's the greatest thing or she's the greatest thing you've ever had in your life. But then you get addicted to pornography. And no longer do they satisfy you. It seems like they're just not what they used to be. You know what happened? You begin to change your opinion of your spouse. They did change. They're no different. Same person you're, you're married and they've always been. But you change your opinion. See, if, if you're not careful, this relationship you have with God... If you start looking at the world and what the world has to offer, you start seeing God in a less valuable fashion. Right. God never changed. God's no different. He's just as wonderful and glorious as he's ever been. Amen. But you start seeing Sunday afternoon ball games more important than God's house. Right. You, you start seeing a, a job making some money more important than, than the things of God being a blessing. And things start drifting. And your relationship with God isn't as intense as it was. I don't know about you, when I start seeing that in my life, and I do, we all do. When we get our eyes on something besides God, we start seeing an attraction. It becomes an addiction. And then it becomes a war in our life. And when that happens, I just want to strengthen my relationship with you. I just, I just want to look back in the eyes of God and say, God, I am so sorry. I want to love you and love you more than I ever have. 
There's been times in my physical relationship where the devil I've had to look at my wife and say, honey, I am so sorry. There's been times I've come to my wife and said, honey, I, said, I, I have fallen in love with you so much more than I ever have before. We've been, we've been married 32 years. We have, we have 125 kids. <laughs> we've got kids everywhere. But you know what? Sometimes I have to say, honey, I, I need to fall in love with you. I want, I want to get back, I want to get back to the place where we once were. When we looked at each other, there was an exciting spark that just exploded in our hearts because of just being here. She'd come home from Ohio the other day. She was more out. She'd come in, she was tired. And when she walked through the door, I seen the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. Just because she'd come home. And I looked at her and said, it's not because you're here, the twins are here, and I know you're getting ready to take them. I have sure missed you. The moment she walked in the door, I said, well, hello, beautiful. I want, I want my relationship with God to be so intimate and fresh. Every time I open up this Bible, I just say, well, hello, beautiful. You are so wonderful. What can we talk about today? <laughs> I don't want to read this like a, like a book of demands. I want to read this like a love letter. To keep me fresh and intimate with him this far. And if I read something there, Brother Dale, you know, my wife might tell me when I get home, said, honey, you've got to pay this bill. She's not telling me, all right, it's time to hate me now. I'm not as pretty as I used to be. She just reminded me of a place of neglect in my life. It shouldn't make me look at her any different. It shouldn't make me say, you're right, honey. I am so sorry. I forgot. <laughs> let me make that up. Let me, let me fix that. That's the way we all look at the Word. When we see something that's different than what we're wanting, we just ought to say, God, you're right. I need to fix that. I don't want, I don't want anything to hinder our relationship, God. Amen. So, Lord, if you'll help me, I'm going I'm to stop that. Lord, if you'll help me, I'm going to start that. I'm going to live the way you want me to live, God, because I want our relationship to be fresh. I want nothing to be in my way. Amen. Amen. I like that. While he plays, God spoke to your heart. I'm going to hush. You might, Lord.